This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. Go to cardkingdom.com to pre-order Ravnica Allegiance right now. Hello everyone, I'm Nitsa Hohn, and today we're continuing with the full set limited review of Ravnica Allegiance by looking at all the red cards. Last few days we've looked at all the white, black, and blue cards. We're continuing along tomorrow with green and then multicolored cards and so forth. In this video I'm going to tell you what I think of all the red cards in Ravnica Allegiance for the limited format. If you're new to these videos and you're not sure what my grades mean exactly, you can go to a link in the description below that will take you to my grading guide video. Now let's get started. First up we have Act of Treason, a card we've seen roughly a million times. For two generic and a red, it's a common sorcery. It says gain control of target creature until end of turn. Untap that creature, it gains haste until end of turn. Act of Treason often shows up in formats that have lots of sacrifice outlets, and this is one of those. It is most of the time only going to be worth playing if you have ways of stealing your opponent's creature and then sacrificing it. It is kind of playable in an aggro deck since oftentimes taking your opponent's best creature and smashing in with it can give you lethal, especially if they wanted to block with it. But unless you have like five ways of sacrificing stuff, I think you should steer clear of this. It's sort of a build around, I guess, but I think it's just a D in the vast, vast majority of decks that the build around idea probably isn't worth giving a grade for. Though if I had to, I guess I would say it's probably a C in a deck with enough sacrifice outlets. Next up, we have Amplifier, which for two generic and two red is a 1-1 elemental at rare. Then there's a huge block of text that says... At the beginning of your upkeep, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature card. Until your next turn, Amplifier's base power becomes twice that card's power, and its base toughness becomes twice that card's toughness. Put the revealed card on the bottom of your library in a random order. As far as wordplay goes, this card gets an A+. But as an actual card, I don't think it gets very close to that. You don't need me to tell you that a 4-mana 1-1 one, one is absolutely terrible on the vanilla test. And yes, this does get huge stat boosts every single turn, sort of. But the fact that you don't have much control over how that goes is a little frustrating. What's more is, even if things are going really well, this is just going to be a huge vanilla creature who can be easily chump blocked. This card kind of reminds me of Tilanali's Skin Shifter, a creature who could potentially make itself much bigger every turn. The problem with that card and with Amplifier is that they revert to a single toughness and can be killed by just about anything after they're done being big. Now, this is probably better than the Skin Shifter because the Skin Shifter had to target a creature to gain its stats, and if it got destroyed in response, you were in a lot of trouble, and that can't happen here. Overall, I think this is playable, but not the kind of rare you go after even remotely early, and not the kind of rare that always makes it in your deck even. I think it's a C-. Next up, we have Burn Bright, which for two generic and a red is a common instant, and it says creatures you control get plus two, plus zero until end of turn. I don't really like cards like this. I like pumping your entire team for sure, and you can win the game out of nowhere with it, but because this effect doesn't pump toughness at all, it's much weaker than most cards like this. With something like Inspired Charge that pumps toughness, you can cast it before you can straight up do lethal to your opponent more frequently, because you can use it to make your guys who get blocked win in a few of the combats while destroying your opponent's board and getting in for some damage. Here you have to be going wide enough that you can basically do lethal, because the combats aren't really going to be going your way so much. Your guys who get blocked are are much more likely to die without a toughness boost. All that said, this probably will have a place in an ultra-aggressive red deck like Rakdos and Gruul. Both, both look like they can be that, but I think most of the time you don't want to play it. I'm giving it a D+. Next up is Burning Tree Vandal, which for two generic and a red is a 2-1 human rogue at common. It's got Riot, which is the Gruul mechanic, and what that means is when it enters the battlefield, you get to make a choice between either putting a plus one plus one counter on it or allowing it to have haste. Also says, whenever Burning Tree Vandal attacks, you may discard a card. If you do, draw a card. I like what they did on a lot of these Riot creatures, and this is a good example of that. Both options here have their place. If you really need to rummage right away and your opponent's shields are down, you can go for the haste. If you'd rather have a 3-mana three 3-2 three if you need more power to be able to attack or, or block with it, or foresee yourself needing to trade in any way, you can do that too. Both of those options are fine and make this a solid option for a 3-drop in red decks in this format. By adding Rummage to an early game creature, it means that it can have some late game effectiveness since it can help you improve your draws. I think it's a solid C. Next up we have Cavalcade of Calamity, which for one generic and a red is an uncommon enchantment, and it says whenever a creature you control with power 1 or less attacks, Cavalcade of Calamity deals 1 damage to the player or planeswalker that creature is attacking. 
So this is kind of a build around, but it kind of isn't because I think making use of this effectively is impossible. You need to be attacking with small creatures or this just isn't going to do anything. In limited, making a deck with enough small creatures to make this really go is pretty much impossible. Sure, if you pair it with white or black, you get spirit tokens maybe, and red, as we'll see, can make some tokens too, but it still isn't worth it. Even if you do manage to get enough one power creatures to make this make sense, you're stuffing your deck with one power creatures and that's just not a good game plan. They will quickly get outclassed in most games and that's why this is an F. Next up we have Clamor Shaman for two generic and a red is a 1-1 goblin shaman at uncommon with riot and when she attacks target creature and opponent controls can't block this turn. This really makes me miss the days of Goblin Heel Cutter. Even if this isn't quite the Heel Cutter, I do think it's still going to have a similar effect in aggressive decks. I think more often with this one, you'll be choosing Haste on Riot because this coming down and making something unable to block immediately can often really open the floodgates and let your whole board go crazy. Sometimes you'll have to make it a 2-2 if there's no advantage in the haste at the time. This is a frightening card to back up with combat tricks too because your opponent will desperately want to kill it to put an end to that powerful attack trigger so combat tricks can potentially really blow them out. In the end though, the really subpar stats on this thing definitely hold it back and I think they hold it back from being anything more than a C+. Next up we have Dagger Caster, which for 3 generic and a red is a 2-3 Viashino Rogue and Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, it deals 1 damage to each opponent and 1 damage to each creature your opponents control. So this is a much worse Goblin Chain Whirler. It has the same into the battlefield trigger, but costs more, doesn't have first strike, and has worse stats. Obviously none of that really matters in a limited format that doesn't also have the Chain Whirler, just pointing out how recently they designed a very similar card. I think most of the time, this will probably help you take down at least one creature. There are enough X1s and creature tokens around that it seems likely it does that. Wizard seems to have given almost every color a way to deal with swarms of flying uh, tokens, which may be an indication of just how strong those will be. Worth noting that this does help you get Spectacle going. Now, obviously, you paid four for it, so that won't come up a ton since you won't frequently have that much mana left over. Also, it's good to keep in mind that you can sort of uh, have a bunch of attacks and maybe your opponent blocks in certain ways that there's enough damage on your opponent. Creatures that playing the dagger caster makes it lethal. So you don't even need it to all be X1s. Obviously, that's ideal. But sometimes you can set this up even without creatures being small enough to just outright die to the one damage alone. I think this is something you feel fine about having in your deck. And against some opponents, it probably overperforms if they're just loaded up on X1s. But I'm going to give it a solid C. Next up we have Deface, which for one red mana is a common sorcery, and it says choose one. Destroy target artifact, destroy target creature with defender. This is a sideboard card and not a very good one. There aren't enough artifacts or creatures with defender in this format that are actually you know, relevant for this to get sighted in very often, and it's an F in your main board, and I guess like a D in your sideboard. It's one of those cards that you're like, yeah, this is a sideboard card, and then you play the format and you find yourself never actually putting it into your deck. Next we have Electro Dominance, which for X generic mana and 2 red mana is a rare instant, and it says Electro Dominance deals X damage to any target. You may cast a card with converted mana cost X or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. This is a card that people are really excited about for Constructed, and I think it's pretty good in Limited, but I don't think it's as good in Limited as people seem to be thinking it will be in Constructed. The problem with X spells oftentimes is that they are never going to be efficient. Even ones like Blaze, you generally have to spend more mana than the creature that you were killing cost your opponent. That said, they have the bonus of being able to go after the opponent late. This version helps you get around the fact that you frequently tap out for a card like this because it lets you cast a spell for free too. Sometimes it will just be an expensive Blaze because you don't have cards in your hand that fit the bill or whatever, but the upside here is very real and most of the time I think you will cast a free spell when you cast this. While not premium removal on its own, the additional value is enough to push it into that type of grade. I think it's a B plus. I think it's close to being, you know, that A-level sort of windmill slam first pick. As it is, it's just a first pick like 90% of the time. Next up, we have Feral Maka, which for one generic and a red is a 2-2 cat at common. Vanilla 2-mana two 2-2s two are not so great these days. We just get a lot more for 2-mana most of the time now. You'll play this if you desperately need to fill out your 2-drop slot, but that's pretty much it. It's a D plus. Next up we have Flames of the Raise Boar, which for 5 generic and a red is an uncommon instant and it does 4 damage to target creature and opponent controls. Then, Flames of the Raise Boar deals 2 damage to each other creature that player controls if you control a creature with power 4 or greater. 6 mana to do 4 damage is not a very good deal. It's removal, sure, but if that's all this did, I can't imagine it being more than like a C or C-. minus. This is a lot like the black removal spell we saw yesterday where it has such a wide variance depending on whether or not you can get the power 4 or greater thing rolling. 
Obviously, when you are able to get that part going, you're absolutely thrilled to be paying six mana to kill at least one creature and maybe be taking down a few others. It's going to give you a two for one, at least most of the time, when you cast it. So, a lot like that card we looked at yesterday, this is another one where I kind of have to give it an average. It's like maybe a C or C minus uh, most of the time, but if you can get the four power or more thing rolling, it's probably a B or a B minus, and I'm sort of going to split the difference there and give it a C plus. Again, like the card we looked at yesterday, this may also be potentially first pickable because it does have like a kind of sort of reasonable floor and a really, really high ceiling. Next up is Gates Ablaze. For two generic and a red, it's an uncommon sorcery and it deals X damage to each creature where X is the number of gates you control. This intrigues me a lot. If you ever wanted to make a five color grab all the gates kind of deck, this enables it incredibly well because it can allow you to be a dirtily deck just trying to play cards of a bunch of colors, you know, so you have a higher power level than your average deck. Because once you have around four gates in play, it will just start wiping the board. This is the kind of card that can help a deck that went crazy on gates survive long enough to make their game plan happen. With all that in mind, I think most of the time in this format, it's not going to work out. It's, a, it's obviously a build around. If your deck has like two or three gates in it or less, it's just a straight up F. It's just not going to do enough in those situations. Another sort of aspect of it that you need to keep in mind is that you probably don't want that many of your own really small creatures because they'll die to your gates ablaze. So you need something like six or seven gates, so this can sort of consistently at least do two damage, and the more damage it does, the better. If you can make it a board wipe a consistent number of the time, it's great. But I do think it's going to be difficult for it to really be a straight-up board wipe. I think most of the time it'll be Pyroclasm-esque. Maybe it'll, you know, Flame Break-esque as well. You know, three mana to do three would be pretty nice. But because it has such, you know, demanding... Um, build around stuff going on between needing gates and not wanting that small of creatures. I don't think its ceiling is incredibly high. I don't think it's the kind of thing you want to first pick. I think it's a C. However, if you find yourself with some gates and you see this and you're playing red, you can think about taking it. It'll probably wheel unless there's a bunch of people trying to build a crazy gate deck, which could happen because it does look like fun. Next up we have Gore Clan Wrecker, which for three generic and a red is a 2-2 human warrior at common. It's got Riot and it's got Menace. So this creature is either a 4-mana 3-3 with Menace or a 4-mana 2-2 with Haste and Menace. I think the first option will be the more impactful one. Menace is always a nice evasive ability, especially when you can back it up with combat tricks, but having it on a 2-2 long term is way worse than a 3-3. There are just too many ways to double block a 2-2 and not even lose any creatures. If this was just a 4-mana 3-3 with Menace, it would probably be a C-, and the addition of the flexibility, because sometimes, you know, you'll just need to get in for 2 damage or something, and that's your best option. Having that additional flexibility, I think, does push this all the way up to a straight-up C card you feel fine about having in your deck. Next up, we have Goblin Gathering, which for 2 generic and a red is a common sorcery, and it says create a number of 1-1 one, one red goblin creature tokens equal to 2, plus the number of cards named Goblin Gathering in your graveyard. This is interesting. These types of collect them all cards are always kind of weird to review because one copy of this is not especially good and probably a, not that playable of a card, a card you play if you're desperate, like a D. Two copies maybe gets you up to a D+, and if you have four or more, it probably pushes all the way up to C+. If you can consistently make at least three goblin tokens with this, you're going to be in business. Rakdos has lots of ways to take advantage of all these extra bodies with sacrifice and the like, and they can help swarm the board and gruel, so in both cases I think this is probably a fine card if you can get enough of them. I don't think going after them crazy is the best plan, since the ceiling we're talking about here isn't insane and the floor isn't very good either, but if you pick up a few of them late, the third and fourth one should be valued a little higher. I do think it's a C plus again, if you have four or more, which means it's a pretty nice card to have in your deck. Next up we have Gravelhide Goblin, which for one generic and a red is a 2-1 Goblin Shaman at common, and it has an activated ability that costs 3 generic and a green, and it gets plus 2, plus 2 until end of turn. You know, 2 drops that can pump themselves in the late game are pretty nice. They give you some utility all game long instead of just on turn 2. But they're never anything special. They're always basically just seized. The kind of 2 drop that fits fine into your deck, but is never going to be anything special. Next up, we have Immolation Shaman, which for one generic and a red is a 1-3 Viashino Shaman at rare, and it says whenever an opponent activates an ability of an artifact, creature, or land that isn't a mana ability, Immolation Shaman deals one damage to that player. It also has an activated ability where you can pay three generic and two red, and it gets plus three plus three and gains menace until end of turn. 
So usually a vanilla two mana one three is like a D minus. Obviously with this huge block of text, this isn't exactly vanilla, but for some games I think it will be. If you can get it down on turn two, maybe it does one or two damage to your opponent over the course of the game just with its triggered ability, and that certainly doesn't hurt. The activated ability being added to this does make it go from pretty bad and limited to solid and limited. It is almost like they designed this without the ability to you know, pump itself and plan on it being useful and constructed only, but then decided to slap that activated ability onto it so that it can actually do some work in the latter part of the game and limited. And I think that ability does successfully let this crawl out of the D range. I think it's a, a nice solid C. It's not going to be anything special. Sometimes maybe you're up against an opponent who's just like loaded up with adapt and it'll really give them a headache. But most of the time it's just going to be a two mana one three who in the late game can become a little more of a threat as a four six with menace. Next up we have light up the stage which for two generic and a red is an uncommon sorcery. And you exile the top two cards of your library until the end of your next turn. You may play those cards. I like the red card draw effect. It's one of the best design decisions they've made in the last five years or so. It's a way to give red card advantage. It still feels very red. Obviously, if you were paying three for this in most cases, it isn't going to be great. But, you know, in the late game, that might be okay. Paying one for it is kind of silly, though, and could result in you really basically drawing two cards. One thing to keep in mind with Light Up the Stage is that you should never play a land before you cast it. This is because you can play lands from the exiled cards, and you definitely want to use one of those lands before you use the ones in your hand. Overall, this card is admittedly hard to grade. I can see it really doing some work in the mid to late game, though, and I think it's probably a C+. Nice little card that gives red some, some advantage in the mid to late game, and potentially earlier if you can get Spectacle going. Next up, we have Mirror March, which for five generic and a red is a rare enchantment, and it says whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, flip a coin until you lose a flip. For each flip you want, create a token that's a copy of that creature. Those tokens gain haste, exile them at the beginning of the next end step. So this is wacky. So wacky I could see a silly format on Arena where everyone gets one of these in play and just goes crazy with coin flips. The card is kind of hard to judge. It is super expensive at six mana, and if you are behind or at parity when you cast this, get ready to be in trouble. However, if you get to untap with this and you have creatures to play, things could get interesting. Emphasis on the could though, there's also a chance that even if you do untap, that it won't do anything when you get the first flip wrong. I think this is an interesting way for red decks to find a way to win longer grindier games, but it is just so dependent on getting coin flips right, I think I just want to avoid it altogether. I'm sure that I'll end up losing to someone getting seven flips in a row right at some point in a draft video now, but I think it's an F. Next up we have Rick's Mahdi Reveler, which for one generic and a red is a 2-2 human shaman at rare. It has spectacle for two generic, a black and a red, and when it enters the battlefield, discard a card, then draw a card. If Rick's Mahdi Reveler's spectacle cost was paid, instead discard your hand, then draw three cards. Wow, I like this card. Two mana 2-2s two will let you rummage when they come into play. is already kind of a nice card because it's fine when you curve out and can help you dig through your deck in the late game. The Reveler, though, takes the utility in the late game thing to new levels, though, because it allows you to potentially pay four and draw three cards with your 2-2. Two -two. That's insane and could single-handedly win you the game if you can cast it with Spectacle at any point in the mid to late game. Because it has such a good floor and such a high ceiling, this little two-drop is a B plus, something I think you're happy first picking in almost any pack. Next up we have Rubble Reading, which for three generic and a red is a common sorcery. It says destroy target land, scry two. As always, four mana land destruction spells just aren't playable and limited, even if you add scry two to it. The problem with them is that the impact they have on the game is minimal 99% of the time. If your opponent just hits a land drop after you do this, which they have a great chance to do, they're back where they were when you cast this, and you're pretty much down a card. There's plenty of times where you cast this and you feel like you've done something, but it doesn't actually impact your opponent very much because they either have plenty of lands in their hand or they just didn't need the extra land that you just blew up on turn four. Obviously, it's also pretty bad in the late game where destroying one land isn't going to make much of a difference. Again, they did tack Scry 2 onto this, but that still doesn't make it worth it. You'd rather just play a creature, basically any creature than this. It, like all the recent land destruction spells in limited formats, is an F. Next up we have Rubble Belt Recluse, which for 4 generic and a red is an Ogre Berserker at common, and it's a 6-5, and it attacks each combat if able. Those are some very nice aggressive stats for a common. It has to attack every turn, but with 6 power, how often is your opponent going to be able to profitably block this thing? He's probably going to go down, but he's taking a creature or two with him. He's a nice 5 drop for red decks. He doesn't do anything fancy, but he smashes real good. I think you want one at the top of your curve in basically every red deck. I'm giving him a C+. Next up we have Rumbling Ruin, which for 5 generic and a red is a 6-6 six, six elemental at Uncommon. 
And when it enters the battlefield, count the number of plus one plus one counters on creatures you control. Creatures your opponents control with power less than or equal to that number can't block this turn. I really like this card. Obviously, he incentivizes you to choose the plus one plus one counter option more frequently if you're in a gruel deck because that enter the battlefield trigger means business. On top of that, his fail case is a six mana six six, which is basically already a C. If you can get the plus one plus one counters going, he's going to end up getting you in for a ton of extra damage while leaving a huge body on the table. While Gruul probably isn't quite as good at plus and plus one counters as Simic is, the Ruin seems perfectly splashable in a Simic deck too, where he may be even more frightening. This thing is definitely first pickable, sometimes in this format an early pick whose presence on the battlefield will be very impactful, I'm giving him a B-. Next up we have Scorch Mark, which for one generic and a red is a common instant and it deals two damage to target creature. That creature would die this turn, exile it instead. This is nice removal for red decks. I don't think it quite gets to the premium level where you first pick it on a regular basis, but maybe the fact that it can exile annoying afterlife creatures does push it a little higher. As is, it's the kind of common red removal spell you always play, but not the one you're excited about playing, which we'll get to in a couple cards. This makes it a C+. Next up we have Skargan Hellkite, which for 3 generic and 2 red is a 4-4 mythic rare dragon. It's got Riot, it has Flying, and it has an activated ability where you can pay 3 generic and a red and it deals 2 damage divided as you choose among 1 or 2 targets. Activate this ability only if Skargan Hellkite has a plus 1, plus 1 counter on it. I like the design here a lot, where Riot makes you take into account more than just whether it has haste or is bigger. If this was a 5 mana 4 4 with haste, that would probably be enough for it to be a B minus or even a B, and a 5 mana 5 5 flyer is probably about the same, maybe even a B plus. However, when you add flexibility and the potential to have the ability to start damaging things with that activated ability, this card's value gets pushed to the absolute limit. Basically, one side of this is what you use when you're ahead in the game and need to close it out, the haste side. The other side will be way better at breaking up board stalls and winning you a grindy game since that ability can do some serious work, either going after your opponent or their creatures. All in all, I think this pushes the card all the way up to a solid A, making it worth first picking basically all the time. There aren't that many cards I have over this. It is one of the largest bombs in the entire set. So next up we have Skewer the Critics, which for two generic and a red is a common sorcery with Spectacle for one red mana, and it deals three damage to any target. This is an incredibly strong common, an early candidate for the best one in the set, I think. If you get Spectacle going, you have a Sorcery Speed Lightning Bolt, and even if you can't cast it for the Spectacle cost, you're still looking at a pretty efficient spell. It would probably be a C plus on its own. Don't forget this one can go for the head as well. With all that said, I think this is pretty firmly a B. It's an incredibly power removal spell, and it's the kind of card that you feel good about first picking. Next up, we have Smelt Ward Ignis, which for one generic and a red is a 2-1 elemental at uncommon, and it has an activated ability. We can pay two generic and a red to sack it, gain control of target creature with power three or less until end of turn, untap that creature, it gains haste until end of turn, activate this ability only anytime you could cast a sorcery. So a 2-drop that can get in for some damage early and then have late game value is going to make the cut and that's what we have here. Being able to use it to clear a small creature out of the way that then joins the attack is great. It's a little annoying, it's so limited on what it can steal. And, you know, sometimes threat and effects are really powerful because your opponent doesn't know they're coming. They'll know that this is a potential and that's a problem, but it's a solid little playable for red decks. It's a C. Next up we have Spear Spewer, which for one red mana is a 0-2 Goblin Warrior at common. It has Defender, and you can tap it to deal one damage to each player. So if you need a Spectacle Enabler, this is probably one of the better ones around, at lower rarities anyway. At only one mana, it can make sure you can cast things for their Spectacle cost from er very early on in the game. Generally, if you're in red 2, the damage is going to bother your opponent more than it will be bothering you, because you're trying to win the game as quickly as possible. While less good in decks that aren't red-black and thus can't take full advantage of Spectacle, I imagine it's fine in Gruul decks too. I think this is a C. Its usefulness with helping you enable silly things with Spectacle is hard to overlook. Next up we have Spike Wheel Acrobat, which for 3 generic and a red is a 5-2 human rogue at common and it has Spectacle for 2 generic and a red. This is not the most exciting card to Spectacle. 3 for a 5-2 is pretty alright, I guess. But it isn't like the vast majority of 2-drops in this format can't trade with that. I don't think I'm very interested in playing this thing in most cases. It's just a D. Next up we have Storm Strike, which for 1 red mana is a common instant, and it says target creature gets plus 1, plus 0, and gains first strike until end of turn, scry 1. Look out, it's strictly better Kindled Fury. Kindled Fury was never an especially good trick, but it was one you ran sometimes. I think this is the same, even if you do add Scry to it. The trick only lets you effectively take down creatures who are the same size as yours, or who have one more toughness than it has power. 
Tricks are best measured, I think, by how big of a thing they can help you take down, and while this can go bigger and certainly give you a mana advantage in many cases, I don't think it's worth the risk most of the time. Be on the lookout for getting two for one when your opponent either uses their own trick or a removal spell. You have to be careful about when you cast this. While that said, I do think that it's an alright 23rd card, which makes it a C-. Our last red card is Tin Street Dodger, which costs one red mana. It's an uncommon goblin rogue. It's a 1-1 with haste, and you can pay one red to make it so it can't be blocked this turn except by creatures with defender. One mana 1-1s one that are unblockable are not usually very good, unless there are good ways to pump it like we saw with that merfolk in Ixalan, which also had a relevant creature type. This isn't even always unblockable, as you have to pay mana to get that effect, and then, if your opponent has defenders, you're going to look really silly. Haste doesn't make it much better either. I think you avoid playing this in most cases. It's just way too slow, and the mana it asks you to invest in it is going to get really annoying really quickly. That's a D. Well, that does it for all the red cards in Ravnica Allegiance. Tomorrow, I'll be back to talk about all the green cards. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so others can enjoy it too. And if you want to make sure you catch the rest of my Ravnica Allegiance content, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.